Hi, Alan. Hi, Nico. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Very well, thanks. Hi, Kirk. Hey, how you doing? Oh, very well, thanks yourself. Meet Alan. <laughs> Good to see you again, Alan. You too, Kirk. Yes, you guys have met, of course. You've spoken in all our groups. Yeah. I really enjoyed your last one. Very fitting for the time. Yeah, interesting. So imagine how many sessions have you had on Zoom today already, Alan? Or uh, today, this is number three. Okay. Although not all Zoom. Okay. I've, I've been on five different platforms, I think, in the last week. Oh my goodness. So it's amazing what technology can do for us, eh? Totally. It's magic. Yeah. What would we have done without technology? Yeah. There's there was one group based out of the UK and they had I can't even remember the name of it. I think it was called Present Me. And it was awful. Like, oh, really? Just, oh, no. Yeah. And everyone's going, why are we using Zoom? Yeah. So, it was quite funny. Yeah. So do you think Zoom is one of the best platforms? Or do you uh, think Zoom? I really like the two that I've, been, I've found the best so far are uh, Zoom, as long as uh, sorry, Zoom and Google Hangouts, but Google Hangouts, I, I think it maxes out at a certain number of people, even if you've got the plugin. So I really like the ability to see everyone if possible. Okay. If you're just going to do that to my view here. Hi, Simon. Long time no see. <laughs> like three minutes or four minutes. He was on the previous session. <laughs> yep. Spend my day talking to Nico. I think you can work at some point. Could have been a worse day for me. I'm I'm delighted. <laughs> and Kirk, you saw Simon this morning, I think. Yes, Kirk was on. Um, Kirk, you're on. I, I was there this morning, and then something for some reason just my whole program died, and I couldn't get back online. I got the spiraling circle of death every time I tried to get back in. Oh. And finally, just said no more. Oh no! So I'm super happy my Zoom and my camera's back up to working. So um yeah. technology huh yeah it's amazing hi kirk i've got about 18 people who said they'll come some will come some won't come i've learned if they come they come if they don't they don't we move on yes yeah. plus are so busy with different things but it's great to see you guys hi. long time no see kirk <laughs> <laughs> Been a little while, hasn't it? Yeah, well, at least a day. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, eh? Yeah. So, um, what is what about Microsoft Team? Was it Microsoft Teams? Uh, how have you found that, Alan? You Teams, know? Teams has been great as long as it's a really small group because it can only handle four people on the screen at a time. Oh, that's so. the problem. Yeah, and you want to see the whole room, especially yeah. if you're facilitating yeah isn't yeah. that a function of which version you have or which license you have because i think you can do more i i wasn't aware of that so that that's good to know i didn't know that i, I i'm not 100 percent sure about that but i think so I, i'll check i'll let nico know because i'm pretty sure that some of our people use teams for quite big groups something that i've seen on teams um, or microsoft teams you can do more than one sound or multiple microphones, which you cannot do on Zoom. Zoom is whoever speaks has got the microphone. Because we try to do a choir, I'm, I'm in, in two different choirs, and we wanted to sing together. Right. Big disaster on Zoom. It didn't work at all. <laughs> whoever was loudest got that note. <laughs> we, used, we used Teams, and we've used it pretty successfully with eight to 10 people in a meeting. Okay. Good. And are you able to see everybody at the same time? Yeah. Good to know. Learn something new every day. Yeah. But I'm pretty happy with Zoom. It's quick to get into, quick to get out, and it's easy to work, and mostly it works. It's much better than Skype ever was. Yes. In my opinion. But what do I know? I'm just standing in my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we know what you're doing when you mute us. 
Well, someone on one of the uh, announced it in one of my other groups. So I got a text from one guy who said, "If you sit down, we're in trouble." <laughs> Stay standing. <laughs> I see Luke coming, and I look. Hey, Luke. Oh, he's gone again. Hi, Luke. Oh, there you go. Welcome. We'll give it a few minutes and then we'll get started. How are you doing today, Luke? Oh, busy as usual. There you go. Getting the furniture out the door. Oh, uh, yeah. Pivot, pivot, pivot. That is uh, my new favorite word. Oh, there you go. Good. How are you doing, Alan? I'm very well, thanks. Great to hear. Great. Yeah, thank you. Good, good, good. How's it going, Kirk? Oh, there's two Kirk. Sorry, Kirk. Kirk Spinks first. <laughs> uh, very good, thank you. So uh, it turned out to be a really nice day. Yeah, it has been. Yeah. All right. Give it three more minutes, and we'll get started. Sure. I mean, people can just join us. They come in, but I want them to get the whole thing. Yeah. Alan has got a lot of good stuff for us all right. And this is a new, the first time that I'll hear this topic, Alan, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, usually it's uh, around five or six. And now Graham was coming. Um, we've got me coming, Arlene, John Rupel, Liz Scott coming. This Liz is coming. We'll start five after. If they're not in, they're not in. Hi, Scott, can you hear us? <coughs> From Scott to everyone, yes. But he's not speaking. You can't hear us then. I can unmute you. You can speak now. We've lost Luke again. No, I hit video instead of mute. My mistake. Okay. Now I'll mute. There you go. Hey, Spam. Switching to headset. Okay, Scott's coming. Pam's coming. Hopefully the dog thing is organized now. <laughs> hi, Pam. Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's fine. Alan, hi. Hi, <laughs> so nice to see you. You too. She's in Kamloops and she's got horses in her garden. So if she just takes off, it's not about you, Alan. It's about the horses. <laughs> hi, Maggie. Long time no see, eh? <laughs> okay, where are we now? 303. Two more minutes and we'll get started. Yeah, my water. Scott must not be camera ready or something. I don't know. So how many sessions have I had today so far? One, two, three, four, five. This is my sixth one. It's been a good day. <laughs> See how much more efficient you can be at home? Yeah, my goodness, it's fun. phenomenal because you've got no travel time, which is fantastic. I love it. it. Takes five seconds and you're in the next one. There's Scott. Okay, well, one more minute and we'll get started. There are plenty of other people who've said they're coming, but if they're not making it, I don't want to make this too long. Okay, let's just, when Kirk is back, let's wait for Kirk Forbes and then he's, he said he's just getting water and when he's back, I'll get started. I am recording this, if that's okay, Alan. What? Is it okay to record yeah. you? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just use it for internal use for anyone who no, couldn't no. make it. Okay, it's five after, let's get started. Okay, so I'm not gonna have a long introduction to Alan um, or his whole um, CV because he's spoken in all our groups before, but just to give you a bit of a background and a, um, um, so that you can remember that he is a strategic advisor and he started share loss in Canada in 2010 or he brought the magic because he was exposed to the magic when he was working for Colliers, I believe. And he decided he's going to bring the, the, the magic to us. So he started doing that in 2010. And he was in Colliers International for 18 years. And his last position was Colliers' executive vice president 
global chief operating officer, and he was also on the board of directors for Collier. So he comes, he brings a wealth of information, lots of experience, and he's an incredible speaker. And today we've asked him actually, because we were looking for something in this area. So I'm not sure if he developed it proactively or we came with some ideas, but I'm just delighted that we've got him to come speak to us. And the topic is how capacity conversations can help you survive and thrive during and after the pandemic. So without further ado, let's give over to Alan. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Okay, uh, as always with uh, my approach, please interrupt anytime. Don't wait for the end of something. Just jump on the microphone or stick your hand up. Um, I don't want you to have to sort of linger with thoughts in the back of your mind. So please just jump in anytime. And I'm basically gonna jump into this right away. Uh, the reason I came up with this, so the framework I'm going to share with you, I've actually been using for 13 years in various different applications. And the more I was talking to leaders of businesses and hearing what they're struggling with, like this framework just kept coming out. And then the light bulb went on and I thought, well, why don't I get this sort of proactively out into the world? So. Uh, the good news is the framework is not just something that you can use in these challenging times. It's something that I hope you can see and hope you utilize just at any time when you're thinking about growth in the business. So I'm going to do three things. I'm going to share just the core of the framework fairly quickly just to create a base because part of this is definitions and it's not right versus wrong, but if we're using different definitions around certain words, then it's, everything else is gonna be confusing. So quickly, I'll give you the framework, and then I'm going to give you a visual of what I see in terms of the most extreme impacts of COVID-19 and the restrictions and the economy and what that's uh, doing for businesses. And then part three is a discussion around, okay, practically speaking, like what are the things to be doing in terms of using this framework um, in order to maximize success, both sort of dealing with financial stress if you have it, um, but also setting yourself up for taking advantage of um, what's not likely to be exactly the same world anytime soon, even as uh, restrictions are relaxed. And then I wasn't really planning for like formal Q&A at the end. We probably will have some time for that. Um, again, I'd rather you just stop me whenever with your questions and we'll deal with Q&A throughout. Okay. Any questions or comments with me before I jump in? Just give me a thumbs up if you're good to go, good to keep going. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a definition of the word capacity and then use that for the balance of the session. So the definition of capacity that we're going to use, and we're going to use the concept of, of a cup and water in the cup. And so the definition of a full cup, meaning your capacity in this moment, is the maximum revenue you can generate with the current resources you have and in the current environment that you find yourself in. And it's a different definition than some other capacity definitions, which usually focus on like, what is just the most product we can generate from a factory or the most projects we could manage for clients or the most number of hours of services we could provide. And those are important concepts too. So I'm not saying those are wrong, this is right. But when we think of capacity as the maximum revenue we can generate with the resources we have and in the environment that we have, it creates some different conversations. So this is the maximum and the level of water in the cup is a representation of the current revenue that you have. And what's really interesting is for 15 years, I've been using this framework and I've never had to pause at this point and clarify what it means in terms of how much revenue we currently have. Because in more stable times, we could just look at the last 12 months or the current year forecast. You know, it's, it's not that far out, even if you're growing significantly. 
But at this point in time, we actually need to be really clear that this uh, level of revenue is really your current run rate. And that's actually hard to understand what it is because it's changing daily or weekly. Um, so it's something we just need to continue to monitor more than we ever had before. And so um, it could be the last week times 52. It could be the last month times 12. I would say just think of it as what do you really believe the annualized level of revenue you're currently generating? That would be what I would be going with right now. So if this is the current revenue, the run rate of the current revenue, and this is the maximum, by definition, what we're saying is this gap here, the part that's not full, is uh, what I call a productivity gap, because it, what it's really saying is, if you are operating with perfect productivity, you actually could generate more revenue without hiring more people, opening up a new pro um, into a new market, bringing new products to the market. And so these sorts of things, practically speaking, tend to be um, um, opportunities around collaboration and process and people actually using the training and the tools. Uh, I have, um, I know Pam, you would have seen Drama Triangle before. I sometimes have groups identify that 50% of this gap is entirely due to the drama that shows up in the business, just people being defensive or passive aggressive or uh, pushing each other's buttons, just all the human nature stuff that shows on. And that's, that's lost productivity when people behave that way. So there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do. Um, people not being focused, lack of alignment between vision and strategy and goals and individual. Uh, focus. All of those things represent this gap here. And the question I have for you is, when I've got business leaders who take the time to, let me ask you differently first. When people see this for the first time and they, they know what their current revenue is, but they're not really sure what this gap is, do most people think this gap is smaller than it really is? Or do most people think this gap is actually bigger than it really is? What's your guess? What do you think I hear more often? People, people's guess is, is, is off, but what is, what's the mistake they're making in their guess? Yeah, they think, it's, they think it's only that much room. And the mindset is, I can't imagine working any harder. I can't imagine asking any more from my team. And it's not about working harder, it's about working smarter. So one of the things I would just keep in mind, generally speaking, is we tend to underestimate um, the size of that gap, okay? Now, the next thing in the framework itself is to um, understand the distinction of two types of growth. So I, I'm involved in conversations about growth all the time, and I hear the word growth, and one of the things I've just trained myself to ask is, which type of growth are we talking about? So one type of growth is, how do we grow our revenue inside of our current cup? And another, another type of growth is, how do we actually go out and create a bigger cup? The problem is that when people think that there's only that much room to grow inside their cup, they default to creating a bigger cup. And if you pour the same amount of revenue in a bigger cup, all that happens is your financial margins, your return on investment, and those sorts of things um, end up being very disappointing because you're paying for the full cup but if it's not very full, your margins aren't going to be very strong. Or it, it depends on how you've paid for this bigger cup. Sometimes it's margins, sometimes it's return on investment. Okay. The other mistake I see less often, but it can happen, is that people drive, companies drive productivity all the way to the max. And they don't actually go out and quickly enough create this bigger cup. And therefore, they have no space to grow. And they, they basically say it feels like we're bumping up against the ceiling 
and they actually are. They're running into their capacity ceiling. Okay, so those are just the fundamentals of the framework itself. I just want to pause quickly. Any questions for clarification just on the base framework before we start to apply it? If we're all good, just give me another thumbs up. Okay, now this is what really got me going in terms of the, the hamster wheel running. When I was having conversations over the past month, I was asking myself, what's going on because it's different than this typical conversation? And so this is a representation of the two extremes about what I see going on in the world. So let's just ignore this for a second, as distracting as that is. And let's just imagine this is the cup we were talking about before. And it's back in February. So it's pre-COVID. And we're running along. We've got our capacity. We have our revenue. There's some kind of space here to grow. Pretty simple. Okay. Now, the more typical scenario of what happened once the restrictions showed up in the economy is what's going on up here. And so I like to sometimes, instead of just look at the overall capacity of an organization, sometimes it's useful to break down the capacity by different functions within the company. And you could have five or six or more different sub cups. I'm just choosing three because it's the space I had on the paper. And what happened literally overnight for some companies that are industries where demand just literally dropped off overnight is that their capacity within their sales um, part of the company basically dropped overnight. Meaning you could be super productive, you could actually be massively increasing your market share, but your revenue actually went down and the maximum revenue you could generate with your current resources probably also went down because of what it takes to bring revenue in, to service that revenue, maybe even the pricing um, has changed, sales cycles, all those sorts of things. The problem is, is that even though um, the capacity dropped overnight and the revenue also went down. You're still paying until you make changes in the business. You're still paying for the same capacity that you had before demand dropped off. Not only are you still paying for it in all these other uh, functions in the business, but you're actually still paying. Imagine this was just the sales cup. You're still paying for the same size of the sales cup. But because the environment changed, the maximum revenue you can generate dropped. And so all of a sudden in these types of businesses, no wonder there's massive financial stress because the revenue has gone down. But until you start looking for areas to cut some kind of cost to preserve cash, if you need to, then you're still paying for this capacity that you had before. And some types of capacity like plants and things like that are very difficult to, um, to decrease. And a lot of companies are very hesitant in letting people go because they believe they need to keep those people and keep the culture and be ready for when the market returns at some point. And those are some of the difficult choices we make. So does this make sense in terms of looking at what happened to capacity for industries where demand just literally dropped off the map. Okay, all good. Now, I do have some clients that are experiencing this. And so think, uh, so I've got a client that basically, actually they're okay with me naming them. Um, have you ever heard of Kicking Horse Coffee? Okay, so Kicking Horse Coffee, um, their coffee is bought in more traditional um, retail stores, grocery stores, things like at that and so you've got all these people that used to go to Starbucks and all these other coffee shops and now they're consuming more of their coffee at home and so they're going to the store and buying more coffee than ever did before and I'm not saying this is exactly what it looks like but basically for that type of company their sales cup overnight got bigger and their challenge is 
all of a sudden they're running into these bottlenecks inside of their company because the sales cup all of a sudden exceeded the size of all the other cups. Okay. Um, anyone gone to the grocery store lately and looked for flour and seen an empty shelf? Okay. I found out, I don't know if this is true, but my wife told me yesterday, the problem isn't actually a shortage of flour. The problem is actually for Robin Hood, a shortage of yellow bags. And so if we just call this bags for Robin Hood, this is their capacity issue. And they're losing, maybe permanently, maybe not, but certainly they're losing some revenue. I would have bought some flour today, but the shop was empty. And so they're not getting the full benefit of the revenue opportunity today because there's a capacity challenge or bottleneck showing up, okay? So does this scenario make sense in terms of how it's playing out for these types of companies, okay? Now, of course, it's never as simple as this. If you take a look at the different components of capacity across different functions in any business, at any given time, they're gonna be, they're never gonna be perfectly equal um, because of the fact that it's hard to incrementally grow certain types of capacity. Like you can hire a person at a time, but you can't build 1% of factory capacity over time. They always come in lumps and things like that. So it's very difficult to always have even capacity. But what I would say is over 15 years of asking people, do you know what your revenue is? And people looking at me like, that's kind of a dumb question. And then asking, well, do you know what your maximum revenue is with your current resources? I'd say more often than not, I get a bit of a funny look, meaning I probably have a bit of an idea, but I'm not like when I ask people, how often do you actually calculate this? I don't often get an answer, which is, yeah, we do that regularly. And often the answer is we've never actually done it formally, but as intuitive business people, we have some idea. The problem is when we have some ideas, sometimes we actually don't actually know. And we don't know if we're balancing capacity across different parts of the organization. Okay. So let me pause again, just any comments or questions before I get to you know, what to do, uh, but any comments or questions about what the pandemic and the restrictions in the economy have done in the extreme examples of demand surging and demand dropping. Okay. Just by a quick show of hands, can, how many of you are experiencing, even if it's to a different degree, how many are experiencing more of this reality? Okay, and how many are experiencing this reality? I mean, most people say, oh, lucky you, good problem to have, but it's still a challenge. And you still want to maximize the opportunity. Yeah, I have a bit of both. It's kind of weird because like we're a brick and mortar retailer. So obviously sales, but our e-commerce or online channel has exploded. So we have a little bit of a hybrid because um, we're not perfectly integrated. Our channels are a little separated. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Overall sales and sales in a brick and mortar channel are, well, are zero. <laughs> They're down, you know, 100%, but the yeah. e-com is, uh, you know, through the roof. Yeah, and so I have a client who's got the same story, and they were the inspiration for one of the comments I had in the article about, so one of the examples, I said, well, what are you doing? Like, that's crazy. What are you doing? And she said, well, we're, like, as quickly as possible, we're training all of the people who used to be in our retail stores and we're training them to support all of this online activity that we can't keep up mm -hmm. with. And to me, that's another example of balancing capacity across different parts of the business. So I'm, I'm guessing you're experiencing some of that. Yeah, like we, um, we adapted, uh, you know, I guess what we fall under production, uh, but um, as the sales have grown, uh, our four custom production, we've now hit like the ceiling. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the challenge. And then of course, um, the way that we had our like uh, final mile set up, we've almost hit the ceiling in final mile. So it's amazing how uh, 
even though sales are down capacity, we always have to uh, continue to, I'm saying pivot because yeah. the sales are, uh, uh, the operations to service the sales now are different than they were before. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and other sort of challenge, challenges I'm hearing out in the world is there's this current phase that we're in that's causing us to move resources around, maybe cut, maybe grow, maybe just reallocate. And it's definitely the best way to manage resources in this moment. And then the question starts popping up around what's it going to look like in a month from now? And our, you know, the pivot word is, is exactly what's going on in that conversation. When are we going to have to pivot again? And I mean, most people are saying it's, it's not going to go back to what it was overnight. A lot of people are saying that could be two years and, but it's going to happen in phases and it could go back and forth. Like we could see easing um, and then we could see restrictions coming back. And so we need to be ready for potentially two years of pivoting across different realities and therefore reallocating um, capacity all over the place. And then, and part of the story I'm also hearing is I need to be careful not to add too much capacity that's permanent just in case the surge in demand that I've got is actually temporary because I don't want to wake up with, you know, this scenario because I built permanent capacity for something that was just a, you know, temporary surge in demand. Is that all making sense? Okay. All right. I'm going to go back to this page just because it's less busy. And um, so the last part I wanted to share, and then we can get into more discussion, is like, what steps can you take in order to capitalize on um, I can't really read, Nico, if there's something to draw my attention to in the chat, just let me know. I don't want to get distracted by it. So like, what are the steps to do to take advantage of this framework to evolve your thinking and your team's thinking? And so um, one of the things I would highly, highly recommend, and don't treat it as a one-off, but create the habit of at any point in time, actually, so, so please don't hear some sort of perfect calculation because it's always going to be an estimate to some degree but at any given time have an estimate of what your full cup is overall as a company but also in this view of understanding what's the capacity across different components and what the different components are that are going to be relevant is going to be completely different depending on your business industry and uniqueness of your business so when you've got awareness of what your capacity is overall and by different function, it then allows you to, as you see the revenue track up and down, you can see what's going on in terms of like, are you getting close to full? Are you way like far away from being full? And just having that awareness naturally is going to lead you to be thinking about what you need to do about that in terms of adding capacity, where do you add that capacity? How much capacity do you add? Um, what's, the, what's the lag between deciding how much more capacity you need and actually putting that capacity in place? Um, how long would it take for you to remove that capacity if at some point you realized you didn't need it? So at any given time, if you know what your capacity is, overall and across and you're tracking where your revenue is tracking you can just constantly be asking yourself these questions about where is it today where do i think it's going to be and how do i how do i manage this balancing act of what's best for managing today versus what's best for taking advantage of what i believe is going to be the marketplace and the demand a week a month 
whatever time frame is is relevant for you okay and so um one is understand measure your capacity even if it's just estimating number two is to like if there was ever a time especially for these companies if there was ever a time to close the productivity gap now's the time because basically the productivity gap represents an opportunity by definition to grow revenue with the current resources that you're already paying for. And I'm hearing so many inspiring stories around um, people coming together to find, to unite and find a way to, to work differently in order to survive, if it's the word, or be successful in this current environment. And I can't say this is true of every single group that I've talked to, but I would say the clear majority, there's this, um, there's this um, awareness and acceptance within their teams that change is gonna happen. Yeah, go ahead. So I think we've definitely experienced this coming together, finding new ways of working, uh, learning new technologies that allow us to be efficient. We're seeing our utilization go through the roof, working remotely. Uh, we're not sure though how much of a fear factor is feeding into that of, I better make sure that I'm being super productive. Um, and we're a consulting firm, so are those billable hours, are those potential revenue? true revenue i wonder if you have any thoughts on that yeah i think that's a really valid valid comment and i think the reality is it's probably a combination of do the right thing and coming together and some component of i better do this or else and so what i would um, encourage you to do is constantly capture new habits that are really positive, are really productive, and be constantly thinking about how do we hold on to those? How do we actually make them cultural norms going forward? And even if maybe they were sparked out of fear, for them to sustain, they have to come out of the fear space and they have to become, like my favorite definition of culture is simply accepted behavioral norms. And so how do we take something that maybe it came from a fear and turn it into a cultural norm that can survive? And it, to me, it starts with leadership, having the awareness of what are the positive changes that have happened and constantly looking for ways to encourage and reinforce those. And just having conversations about, you know, how do we sustain those going forward without relying on this fear factor to drive it. I think we need to be realistic and we'll probably have some slippage. So the question isn't how do we keep all of it? I think the question is how do we hold on to as much as we can? And I do think it's sort of, it's constant reinforcement of not just, hey, we have to do this, but hey, like this is working. Uh, like and and asking people how do they feel about it how are they how are they what are they experiencing and in some ways the longer the restrictions are the longer we're going to repeat these new behaviors and that's actually how habits form and so part of that conversation is like how do we ensure that we don't ever entirely go back how do we hang on to some of those habits because I think some companies will make a mistake and just say oh thank god we're back to normal let's just go back to the way we're doing it and sort of subconsciously let go of these really valuable positive habits that have started to form does that help okay. any other comments or questions around that because I'm sure you're all experiencing a version of that Okay, so what I was saying was step one, know what your capacity is at any given time. Step two is just find ways to close this productivity gap. And, and 
I'm not encouraging the fear tactic, but I guess what I'm saying is take advantage of the reality of it in a positive way. And if there is acceptance to change, then, and you believe it's positive change and it's in everyone's best interest, then take advantage of that opportunity and create some positive habits off the back of that. Okay. Um, third thing is, is to create what is, you know, maybe two people, it might be 10 people, but like have the equivalent of your think tank. Some people are calling it their war room. And like, I've got some client, like I, I've never done this before, but some of my client work right now, so I'm not doing two day retreats offsite, but I do have a bunch of clients that I'm spending an hour a week with, with typically a leadership team. And basically it's a very open-ended conversation around what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What do you think is going to happen? And I think it's going to turn from every week at some point, every two weeks and maybe every month, sometime down the road. But like three consecutive weeks, there's been no shortage of new awareness and thoughts. And once in a while, there is a decision that comes out of it. But I'd say more of the value coming out of that is this evolving awareness of what's actually happening and, of, and forming some beliefs about what we expect is going to happen. And then converting that into being ready to respond to that. And I just feel like companies that have some form of um, regular cadence around their think tank around the future, given that it's a crazy time right now, are naturally just going to intuitively make better decisions off the back of that. The second benefit is that involving people in that open-ended discussion naturally creates alignment when it is time to make a decision, especially if it's a difficult decision. And so instead of having to take time and say, well, this is what I've been thinking and this is what I'm seeing and this is what I realized I made this decision. Tell me what you think. Great, let's go. The conversation is, hey, we've evolved our thoughts together over a period of time and the group is coming to a, a, a decision and a realization at the same time and you're not having to build alignment. Because one of my very strong beliefs around why great strategy often doesn't work as well as it could is because of a lack of alignment of people to that choice. Rarely do I see ideas and look at them and I go, that's a really bad idea. Like, that's just a crap idea. Rarely do I come across that, but I so often see what look to be winning strategies that aren't successful, and it's the alignment issue that comes to play. Nico? I have a question about bringing people together and going deep. Stuff that we used to do at our retreats, for example, we see that if we spend time together, people can be vulnerable together, but it takes time to get to that place. Now, we don't have that option right now to go off into the wilderness and be together for two days, but we still don't want to lose that place. Maybe even in strategy work, you know, it's a, a, you don't just get started and you're deep. You have to kind of develop and show vulnerability and grow the team and, and then it happens. So to me, the trick is, and maybe you've alluded some of it to it, but how do you do that today where people seem, seem to just have time for an hour long meeting or two hours or, you know, it's all rush, 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 rush. And one thing to the, I'm so worried that we're just going to stay at the surface and not do that deep dive anymore. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, I actually would tie that back to the comment about, you know, some of the openness to change is coming from, from fear. Like there is a, to me, when people go, deeper and connect and be more vulnerable they're traveling into a feeling space and i actually think there's an opportunity to take advantage of like there's a lot of that naturally going on and so one of the, one little tactic that i use to connect into that is sometimes even if it's an hour and a half session 
or even an hour session, I might take five minutes and, and I don't necessarily call it this out loud, but I refer to it in my head as an acknowledgement exercise. So the acknowledgement exercise is basically just um, a, some sharing of what's going on and how people are feeling about it. And then as a leader, encouraging leaders not to judge or tell people how they should be feeling, but just to acknowledge that that totally makes sense. I hear it, I understand it. Um, let's you know continue to support each other through that. So I, I do think that there's, even through, like I actually have found it interesting on Zoom and other platforms that in, I'm experiencing in some way, so there is some loss, but there is some gain in the, uh, the how present people are because we actually, if you look at, if you, like I just look at all the people on the screen, like. I'm seeing you closer than I do when all of you are around the boardroom table. And there's something about that that feels like people are actually paying attention even more. And there's all these articles about how people are exhausted at the end of the day after seven Zoom meetings. I wonder if part of that is how present we have to be. Like, because we're up close, like we're on. And there is a connection, I think, that can be leveraged off the back of that. So, yeah, yeah. so don't hesitate to get into connecting into how are people feeling and acknowledging that would be sort of the summary. Okay. okay. Uh, as you go through the think tank and you're thinking about the future, you can use this framework because when you look at getting back to growth, like you have your capacity, it's whatever full it is, you're looking to fill it. And at any given time, most companies are, are also thinking about what is the next bigger cup? What does it look like? What's going to drive it? How much bigger? And when I talk to companies that have, you know, let's say they're at 5 million today and they have this long-term goal of say 30 million, just as an example. Well, the journey from 5 million to 30 million is not usually one more bigger cup. And so the reality of growth is that you fill your cup, you create somewhat of a bigger cup, you fill that cup, you create somewhat of a bigger cup. And so what I'm encouraging people to do using this capacity framework is, and what I'm really saying is this was your cup in February. For some people, their cup in April is smaller and back here. To be thinking about different phases of growth. So what are the capacity choices to get back to what we had before? What are the capacity choices that are going to be our growth after some kind of return to what we had, probably not exactly the same as before? And I'm finding that when people think about okay, we've had our cup shrink. How do we get back to what we had? When people also think about what might the growth past that look like, the ideas that show up here are typically much more innovative. These tend to be ideas about, hey, maybe we should be thinking about this different type of service or product. Maybe we should be thinking about a different way of delivering it. Maybe we think there's an entirely new industry that we could expand into. Maybe it's, so I, I, just to give you real examples, I had uh, a client yesterday that basically their aha moment that came out of the conversation was they're a, and they're a North American company run very much on a regional basis. And all this virtual work, what they've benefited from that is seeing that they can leverage expertise on certain products that they have of people who are on the other side of the continent in ways they never even thought of before because the old pattern was, well, it has to be a really big deal to bring that person in to justify the travel. Whereas now we don't need to justify the travel and everyone's accepting these virtual meetings. And so they're actually shifting. They haven't decided, but they're, imagining shifting their entire, entire business model 
to being less regional in their thinking and makeup and much more, I'm not sure I want to use the word centralized, but let's call it uniform or connected. Everyone wanted that, but not necessarily were achieving that. And so I just see like the word imagine shows up for me when we think about like, what does the world look like after things settle down? We're not going back to normal. There is a new normal. And what's our opportunity sitting here? And, and I've always heard, and people are continuing to say that the biggest gains in market share come out of a time of disruption. And so how can you create growth out of the disruption because of changing patterns, changing habits, changing beliefs, um, changing needs and things like that. Okay. So measure capacity, monitor your revenue, think about balancing capacity decisions across different almost phases of growth and have your think tank be just continually checking in and evolving your thoughts on it. So let me stop there and just open it up for questions, comments. Um, how are you making decisions today that effectively are managing your capacity even though you're not using that language? Because I believe everyone's doing it. You're just not necessarily using my language of cups and water and things like that. Before we go into that, let's give a virtual thank you to Alan. Thank you. My pleasure. Very much. And then we can go into questions. Questions or just sharing of stories. Yeah. And you see everyone, Alan, can you lead this part? Um, I can, I'm keeping the big screen open so that it records you. Yeah. Okay. So if you can see if someone has a question, just, just go off mute and ask your question or Make your comment. And Chris Lace. I can go here. Uh, we're definitely in the in the um, advantage uh, in COVID here. We're in meat processing, and, and we've literally never been busier. Um, so it's more survival and, and tactical and scrambling and trying to keep up to, to everything in the, in the short term here. And it has been for five weeks and it's not easing up. Um, but I'm trying to get uh, more and more emphasis on our executive team on getting focused back on the, on the long term and the future. And your comment right at the end there about uh, disruption being, uh, you know, historically a great time for market, for gaining market share. Uh, that to me is like the, the, um, the kicker there for, for rallying the troops, so to speak. It, it, is that based on just observation or is there, is there data around there? Is there, is there, I mean, I guess a question for the whole group, is there, have you seen that uh, in quantifiable ways in terms of, uh, I guess there's not really been disruption quite like this ever before, but we're definitely seeing lots of opportunity out there. Um, maybe just expand on that a little bit more if you could. So I'll just comment and then other people can chime in. I would say that I've lost track of the number of articles and presentations. Like it, it has been, I think it's a fair comment around data. I'm, I'm confident it's out there. I don't have the data, but I've heard it over and over and over again. And I've also, like I've experienced it in a previous life. And so I spent 18 years at College International. We were, we had, we had big growth vision. We were always on the growth trail. And when I look at like changes of market share, changes of who were the key dominant players, like I can look back to that and see examples of you know, what happened coming out of downturns and how people um, responded differently. Um, there was one in particular where uh, it was, so it, there was a big downturn in the early 90s in commercial real estate in North America. And coming out of that, there was a shift in the strategy from these bigger companies who wanted to go global. And instead of doing these sort of partnership affiliate things, the strategy was 
go out, raise money and actually acquire, not just partner. <clears throat> and the, 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 the landscape coming out of that and people who pursued that strategy transformed the industry. And it's just one example that comes to mind just in my previous life. And so what happened is coming out of the low, the financial implication that had on a lot of companies, a lot of owners of real estate companies, they basically didn't want to live through another low again. And so they were more willing to uh, be part of a consolidation trend than they were before that. And I, and I guess that word, I'm trying to think who was the company. I was, I was talking to another leadership team and they basically said, we can already hear the conversations that are going to lead to a wave of consolidation in our industry. Like it's already showing up. And so that's another driver of market share coming out of a uh, disruption. Any other comments, whether you agree or disagree or any evidence that anyone else has? Over to Scott. I think you're on mute. There we go. So, I mean, uh, some of it I'm just trying to apply to our business. And obviously there's a rapid decline in sales, but we don't think this is forever. Our teams are busy preparing, but not doing the dreaded busy to keep busy, to, but there's really nothing to produce thing. That could happen. Um, but when I look at disruptions, I honestly think about certain things our kids have seen. They weren't necessarily based on COVID, but I look at how quickly, you know, say Netflix wiped out Blockbusters and basically Blockbusters and Roger's video. And at the time, Roger's video was a client of mine back then. They were gone overnight, right? Because the, the process, the consumer process, they didn't understand that the process was exposed to being, to being broken. So what I look at at real estate is that There'll be things we don't change because the consumer is realizing that there's better ways to go through the search and evaluation of home property other than driving around and looking at sales centers. So I think we're going to be forever changed by this. I think more of our more affordable products might even actually just never move off of not being bought online. And I think they were struggling to get that adoption. And the consumer was even just buying into the realtor, not wanting that thing, saying, well, you always need to talk to an agent. Don't, doesn't mean I don't value the expertise of the give. But I do think this is going to force the consumer to say, hmm, guys, you need to improve this process. This process has been horrible for 43 years. <coughs> Especially in retail, it hasn't happened yet, but it's still very much in our business. But not so much what we do, but what, what co-op realtors do or, or third-party realtors. It's still put somebody in a car, drive them around, tell them stop you, stop you when you see something. Like, it's not a good process. So I guess my long story short is I'm trying to look at process, and I'm looking at the process from the consumer's perspective, buying, using, like, like your point about kicking horse, that's a probably short-term trend because as soon as people go back to Starbucks, they still will. They'll just keep their distance. So those guys, if they go build a huge manufacturer to make more coffee, they could just as fast be done and go broke because they invested so much in premises. Yeah. Then, 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 and so, so you have to be careful if you're really enjoying the benefits of this. Do you not get greedy and then wind up being the guy that owns ten, you know, ten thousand dollars worth of toilet paper and Costco won't take it back? Totally. And, 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 you know, I don't want to go into sort of private conversations and things, but um, what I do know of companies like Kicking Horse that are, I think your description is accurate, is it's not just a, con it's not just a conversation of how do we access more capacity and just grab every dollar of sales we possibly can. Part of it is, okay, given the capacity that we have and we're willing to have and commit to for the long term, what's the best mix of our products in this current environment to maximize the margin side of it, as opposed to necessarily just the revenue side of it? Because you're absolutely right. That's a very practical conversation and uh, you know, companies do need to be careful about you know, overreacting to a surge in demand that's temporary. Thanks, Alan. One last question, perhaps. We're just coming up to four o'clock. One last question or comment. Everyone seems to be happy. Um, Alan, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. I've never seen so many cups together on one sheet. Uh, <laughs> no, happily, happy to see that most of the cups were running over and not everyone was empty. But I think it gives us a very good image of how to build capacity and how to be agile and grow for the next thing and be able to adapt. So it's a very good image to have in our minds. And thank you for 
giving us this more tools to have this conversation and be ready for it. We'll get you back to come speak in all the groups, but thank you so much for handing all, all of us together. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. And I did record the session. If you want a copy of the recording, just um, send me an email and I'll get it to you. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Go out there, build capacity, and let's take this one. Okay. Right. <laughs> yep. right. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Thanks Alan. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. Bye.